Hello, my name is Am Jim Rakai, and today we're going to be getting into the wonderful world of Vegapunk Land. Uh, I, I mean, Dr. Vegapunk's lab. And start to kind of explore the world of illusion and tricks that seems to be Dr. Vegapunk's Egghead Island. And later on in this video, we're going to be touching on exactly what I got right and wrong in my last Vegapunk video and how I don't think that the time thing is very wrong. I just think it's actually gotten a lot more complicated. But more on that than this video. When we start to talk about wormholes, warp drives, and gravity teleportation systems. And if you have haven't already this is a great opportunity for me to ask you to please think about subscribing to the channel and liking this video and leaving a comment and all that stuff to help me out and to kind of ensure that we can I can keep getting weekly one piece and berserk and a song of ice and fire content out you know every week this is not my full-time job I would love it to be someday but right now it is is still just part-time so it is a struggle to get this stuff out any little bit from y'all with comments and likes and subscribes helps me out so so much thank you and if you just want to skip to the juiciest and spiciest takes in this video and kind of how this spread right here breaks down the four winds of the One Piece world and how they manifest themselves and interact with the reality of the manga and shape the actual One Piece manga world and the background and panels themselves. Skip to this point here because this spread right here literally breaks down all of the pillars of the One Piece world in symbolic and literal form and I, it, will, it will blow your mind, trust me. And I've been saying for a while now that I believe that ultimately Dr. Vegapunk is one half of the tree of knowledge of good and evil from all biblical and tree worship, stuff like that. I believe that he is some aspect of that or a branch of that, like a branch of knowledge that has been broken off and might be sent through time to either work back to itself or work to destroy itself. Something along those lines. And these dinosaur monster space slug things are actually a big clue to that, I think. If you notice, they all have the same kind of banana type top of their head as Crocodile's Casino in Alabasta the rain diners, as well as the banana gators themselves. And now Oda has referred in a, a few SBSs that bananas might be traps. And I do kind of think that they all kind of relate to those banana tree myths uh, that Uteron has talked about at length in his channel. But as always, I really don't think anything's one for one. And one of the most important SBSs is about Whitebeard's beard, actually, or his mustache, where Oda says that it could fit six full bananas in there. And I think the idea that it might have six trapped souls or something like that trapped in it at one point, I think could be very real and all of it be symbolizing maybe the moon. But back to these crocodile banana monsters. A uh, big shout out to Mr. UFO on Twitter. I saw us on his post and I'm going to add some stuff to it. But uh, he posted about how crocodile in Japanese is Wani. And Wani plus banana equals wana, which wana means trap in Japanese. Now, what's very interesting is it's actually its origin word means forest. In many languages, that wana or vana word is forest or jungle, and then its romanized word is actually wano, and that might not seem like anything because, oh, Vegapunk, everything here seems so robotic, but let's look at the symbolism of all these stars. Uh, at the height of every single creation, it seems like, in Vegapunk's Wonderland, Wonder Lab, there is a star at the top, but every single one of them seems to have some sort of obstruction that you have to travel through to get to the star, and then everything that's actually functionable is underneath the star like a big Christmas tree. Now, I believe that's all to represent the idea of like how trees do and how trees process light for food. This is a all of the example of photosynthesis and that even all of these bubbles filled with clouds are in my opinion a hint to this idea of trees and you know how trees create oxygen from carbon dioxide and stuff like that along with all of this photosynthesis symbolism but as always with Oda he flips everything all crazy on its head and I think that it's utilizing star power through an outlet source like a black hole or something like that and that's what all of these little rings and hoops are for they all are supposed to represent, like a tree does, taking star energy from somewhere else, reprocessing it and transforming it into a usable thing down below on the surface, like on Earth, from down below. Something to symbolize capturing starlight or sunlight. I, I think that's what this all is kind of referencing in one part symbolically. And I think that the other aspect to all of this stuff is the moon, which we're going to touch on later on in this video. I believe that this spread is a huge spread. That's why I drew it out, because I wanted to show it in the video a whole bunch. But this spread actually breaks up into all of the different, I think, factions and natural pushes and pullers of the One Piece world and them all funneling into creation and fighting against each other. One half of that being light and one half being darkness. But in Vegapunk's lab, in particularly, it seems like he's utilizing light to create illusions. No, I like Willie Nelson. He's got long hair. 
He's alternative. Now you take that back. I followed that man from country western to country to adult contemporary, and that's as far as I'm going. Now, I talk about in uh, my Bing Sock is a Trap vid, I, I just kind of talk a little bit about what SAD might be, and I hinted that I think that one of the big jokes of SAD is that it's actually the acronym for a standard American diet. And here, in this chapter, what do we get? Boom, 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 all, you know, American fast food pretty much. And I bring that up because... We get all of the star symbols and stuff like that. And I do actually think it's all kind of a reference to the American flag and how on the American flag, the stars are in blue. And it's very possible that symbolically, Oda's playing with that as someone has trapped the stars under the ocean or has trapped or taken control of the Earth's core and the power from that. Now, I don't want to get too lost in the sauce with that stuff. I'll have future videos on a lot of stuff because they're just such big, big concepts that I, I cannot break them down in the quick weekly, you know, chapter theory vid that, that these are. If you'd like to see that sooner in the schedule, please comment down below more about this, this whole America flag. I think it deals a lot with Blackbeard, but all of this may be in a reference to colonialism or just America's involvement the last centuries in worldly affairs, just all that stuff in the idea of America being like a policeman of the world and all that crap. I wonder if it's all kind of a clue into like America taking things over and, and you know, at one time fighting for revolution and then now maybe, you know, not the same ideals, stuff like that. At the beginning of this chapter, when Frankie meets Dr. Vegapunk's body thing, he, he mentions how he not only did he kill two years, so he literally says he killed time. Sounds like a season-stealing pun thing to me, very akin to A Song of Ice and Fire. But Frankie specifically mentions that you're my role model, and role model is a very funny word. And I'm going to preemptively apologize for how crazy this is going to get, but I guarantee it's all worth it. Well, I didn't expect a kind of Spanish Inquisition. So the definition of a role model is a person who serves as an example, whose behavior is emulated by others. Our chief weapon is surprise. Surprise and fear. Fear and surprise are two weapons. Our fear and surprise and ruthless efficiency are three weapons. But when you look up the synonyms of that, one of them is a household deity, okay? Our fear and surprise and ruthless efficiency and an almost fanatical devotion to the Pope are four. No. And now a household deity is a minor tutelary deity watching over a household, obviously, usually conceived as a protective ancestral spirit or genius Loki. Uh, well, you know what I'm trying to say? I am the walrus. Uh, that fucking bitch. Oh, yeah. That's ex Shut the fuck up, Donnie. What the fuck is he talking about? Have you ever heard that word before? I consider myself, you know, a, a readed person sometimes, and, and I've never heard that word before. But I guarantee each row Oda has... Because the genus loci, or locus, which means place, is in Roman mythology a minor deity or spirit watching over a particular place. And figuratively, it was always meant as the spirit or atmosphere of a place especially conceived as a source of artistic inspiration. And you'll have to watch my Luffy's Real Dream vid to get way more on that stuff and what, what goes into there. And if you have watched that video with all that boogeyman talk, did you notice what Jewelry Bonnie's new nickname by Luffy is? Bogey? Boogie? Boogie? I, I really think it's all reference to the the what's always on his mind which might just be a dream eater dream catcher thing well i know it's absurd but i dreamed the boogeyman was after me and he's ah! like boogeyman you nail the window shut i'll get the gun but coming back to vegapunk real quickly i think that all of this might be a reference to him kind of being some sort of a guardian to like mechanical evolution maybe like a threshold guardian in some sense to the entire One Piece world's mechanical evolution. Because I said in that my last Vegapunk video that every single technology thing he has either is a human type thing or a animal. Uh, even if it's a robot, it seems to be in the shape of an animal with the sharks and, and all that stuff. And even this, this new Atlas model that we get of this uh, Vegapunk she seems to be looking to me like Chopper. They have the same ears as, at least she's some sort of a mink. And I do actually think that for right now, Vegapunk in particular is after Luffy, Chopper, and Jewelry Bonnie's bodies and fruits. And I wonder if he's going to be able to combine Jewelry Bonnie's aging ability with the giganticism stuff we've heard from earlier in the story. And maybe the secret ingredient is Chopper and the fruit that he ate in some way. 
and going back to playing with that genus loci word, I do kind of think that the atmosphere and the clouds in particular, and some clouds seem to be one type of bird, another cloud seem to be another type of bird, and them kind of naturally battling each other out, you know, in the background all the time, and it manifests itself in some way to, you know, little will reverberations around the entire One Piece world inside every single manga panel. I think is very real. And I know that sounds really crazy, but I think it just kind of works itself naturally into the scenery of every single page. And part of the scenery sometimes is world building and history. And through all of those, all of those things, these characters have naturally arrived in the middle of Egghead Island. And I, I know that sounds extremely crazy, but let's just go through it real quickly. Chopper, while wearing a straw hat he got from Wano, naturally, comes outside on the boat to check things out because he's naturally curious. He might be the most curious animal I've ever seen in media. Gets lifted away by the wind. Because of that, Luffy has to save him. They all end up getting tangled up with Drury Bonnie, who has somehow arrived there in a giant warm eddy, which important to note is cut up by an attack called Bird Dance, which you'll have to watch my Zoro, Dr. Dragon Slayer, Vegapunk thing video uh, that should be out before this one actually for more on uh, that that bird cutting and the the bird kingdom maybe fighting back and then like in marine ford all of the attacks are designed to steer luffy away from his crew and away from his goal into you know a, a, a trap of some sorts which is where jimbei has to save him after falling into the water into the sea and they end up in the inside of egghead island if that doesn't seem like some sort of crazy wind and mechanical and uh, will type scenario situation all combining and, and working together inside the story to make the characters do something at a specific time i don't know what does and honestly how the rest of the crew is saved from underneath the sea is pretty mysterious as well with this explosion perfectly guiding them back into the arms of this vegapunk robot and you'll have to watch my other videos on for more on you know how the animal kingdom seems to be fighting back against the you know the people that feed on it in the one piece world but there's a huge clue to that with that boogie bonnie clue or whatever bonnie's name's very kind of crazy and it can break up into a, a bunch of different things but since we've met bond clay and stuff like that let's focus on that bond for a second in japanese bond means mediocrity monk or tray which i, I think the tray thing is kind of very huge to be like a reference to being served up on a platter but also you know the thing that the holy grail is held on and as a proper noun it means a bond festival or brahma yes the hindu god of creation brahma well what's funny about that brahma word is uh as a like a as a proper word or whatever it does mean the it does refer to that god but it also, as a noun, is a large domestic fowl from Brahmaputra region of India. And it's also a breed of Indian cattle, Bas Indicus. And all of those, I think, are huge, huge clues to sacrificial cattle, sacrificial lambs and birds, angels, all that stuff. And I'll be touching on that in videos coming up shortly. So, like I said, you know, if you like this kind of stuff, please, please, please subscribe. And touching on that tray stuff a little bit more right now, the original iterations of the Holy Grail were a type of plate or tray. And I believe that Oda's kind of taken that and the, you know, quest that the hero is burdened with to find the Holy Grail, all kind of ultimately being a trap a sort of way to serve up a hero on a silver platter to a certain beast, which we're going to get to in a second. And this tray thing's really freaky because I think it's actually the same shape as the floor in this panel here. The blueprints, the, the, this, this floor is obviously a, a blueprint. The, the lines look like they are chalk lines. But it is the same shape as where Roger tells Whitebeard and Odin his dream, quote-unquote. Same snakehead top, and I think it's all a reference to that... Uh, treasure place in the beginning of Aladdin, the Cave of Wonders, and kind of having to go in there and, and everything crazy with that. But we'll touch on that in just a few minutes. Because now we're going to get into the other side of this atmosphere coin, I think, which is the atmosphere and the idea of a snow globe. Rosebud. Is his sled. It was his sled from when he was a kid. 
Bam. And while I do ultimately think that that rosebud snow globe clue from the beginning of Citizen Kane is actually a big clue to the overall One Piece story in the form that in the movie Citizen Kane, the mystery of what Kane is talking about in his final moments and that rosebud while he drops the snow globe, that mystery of what he's referring to kind of drives the entire plot of the entire film. Now, in a not so roundabout way, that sounds exactly like what happened on page one of the manga with Roger's declaration at his execution. And how that literally started off the One Piece story basically the exact same way as the, you know, quote unquote greatest film of all time Citizen Kane did. And I think that in the very same way that what is the One Piece and hunting after it and finding it to become the Pirate King has driven the One Piece story. I think that the Snow Globe stuff is also kind of referencing the beginning of the end by referencing, you know, maybe one of the biggest references to Oda for the beginning. But it's also kind of, you know, starting the, you know, the ending arc of the series. I actually think that that extends to pretty much everything we've seen of Egghead Island and Vegapunk so far. When we first met the Model 2 Vegapunk body, she comes out of a door that looks very similar to a snow globe. Obviously, in the scenery, there's tons of snow going on. We talked about how mysterious everything was that forced, uh, you know, the straw hats to end up where they ended up in these recent chapters. And a snow globe is an artificial housing of a landscape with fluid and fake snowflakes so to me this idea that whatever vegapunk's doing to control the weather here could relate to how the weather's kind of controlled in the snow globe could be very valid but please stick around for the rest of this video we're about to get into the real real crazy spicy stuff of how the blueprints within this snow globe right here are telling us the entire story. We just have to get a little bit real crazy and symbolic with it which is pretty much what Am Jim Rakai is. I love all my children equally. I don't care for Joe. Now, we all know that Ichiro Oda loves A Nightmare Before Christmas. And I think most importantly with all that, he really, really, really loves and is influenced by Tim Burton films. All of them. Not just a Nightmare Before Christmas. Even though Sir Crocodile is modeled after the Boogeyman, and every single ship seems to have a light post modeled very similarly to Jack Skeleton's home, but we also have Edward Scissorhands here, and some references to the remake of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, I think, as well as Alice in Wonderland. But another huge influence that Oda has is Neil Gaiman. And I'm coming out with some videos in October that I've been promising, but some of them are going to be dealing with Sandman and that series by Neil Gaiman and the idea of the dream and the dreamless and all that stuff with that series. Uh, I believe that Gaiman, the Afro man in the treasure chest, is a actual reference to Neil Gaiman. And when it comes to Neil Gaiman and Tim Burton, they actually kind of have a little bit of a connection because a lot of people think that Tim Burton directed The Night Before Christmas, but he did not. He wrote it and all that stuff, but the actual director was someone named Henry Selleck, and Henry Selleck actually directed Coraline as well, and Coraline was based off of a book written by Neil Gaiman. In the Coraline book, her parents, their souls, very akin to Spirited Away, are trapped inside of a snow globe. And I know at first that sounds real crazy, but the idea that anyone you know, who's an inventor is sort of a father of industry or technology in one sense, but we also know that Vegapunk is a father in some idea to devil fruits. And if there's some way that he designed and created devil fruits, or if he in some way at the very least had a hand in manipulating or influencing the gum gum fruit or growing devil fruits in some way, somewhere, and if in some way through time or light manipulation or something, Vegapunk is somehow responsible in part or fully for the gum gum fruit that Luffy ate in chapter one, then I think it's a very fair assessment to make that in some form Vegapunk is one of Luffy's fathers. Considering that eating a devil fruit completely changes the entirety of your body's molecular structure, I think that kind of in some form would entitle you to the epithet of father. And I'm kind of starting to think that like the inside of a snow globe, that fluid that holds everything together and is kind of always there but invisible, might in some way be kind of the reverberations of Vegapunk and his time traveling shenanigans because that's what we're going to end this video on is this just this panel here because all of these background shapes here literally spell out all of the four winds of the one piece world mixing together and what stories are coming from there and what's going to happen to them and i, I think you're going to find it really really fascinating 
just how much symbolically is represented in these background buildings. And I know that father thing can kind of sound outrageous, but what we're talking about here is the background inner workings of the story and the winds itself that seem to formulate and control every single thing that we see inside the panels outside of the characters. And obviously in the One Piece story, absentee fathers are the name of the game. And I think a big part of that is that the ideal that they have left to in some way help the family and and, and send things back and and in some way better the world around, uh, you know, the children these fathers are leaving. I think that in some aspect, part of that is being used as some sort of a dream fuel to actually change the One Piece world. And this sort of playground here and and blueprint land for the Vegapunk Wonder Lab, I believe is kind of the the start of the end and, and one of Oda's hugest keys he's ever given us to sort of deciphering the full end game of the One Piece story. And so I already mentioned how the floor of this whole place is drawn up with chalk, like it's the floors of a blueprint, and I even colored it in blue for the thumbnail and all that sort of stuff. And I believe that that's because this whole thing kind of shows the plans of the various powers in the One Piece world. I think one way to look at it is like the four winds all connecting from the north, south, east, and west, all of them mixing in and kind of making a, a story around the, the world of the One Piece. And so... Each one of these kind of structures in the background breaks down a huge aspect of the story. And we'll just start with the easiest one first, this one in the middle. So to start with, we don't see any of the punk word of Dr. Vega Punk. We just see the Vega. And I think actually in this case, it's supposed to represent age V or the fifth age. Trying to consider everything, maybe this is the fifth iteration of the One Piece world or the fifth time it's been reset and controlled, something along those lines. But getting a little less crazy, we only see the Vega of the Vega Punk word. And I think that's because we only are kind of seeing half of the overall picture of the red line here. This can stripe pillar thing to me i colored it in the uh, same colors as the sabodi archipelago trees the yarukiman mangrove trees and how all of those trees kind of had those stripes on them well this thing does too and it even kind of has the bubbles in there and honestly i would argue that there's probably five of them five bubble island structures maybe all representing the five original elder stars and maybe the branches of their family that inhabit the top or inside of the red wall in some way and this whole many islands pillar thing red line symbolism tree thing how it at the bottom i think actually kind of connects to fishman island and a big clue to that comes up to us in this next chapter where everyone gets their new outfits well jim base is a hawaiian shirt and ho- an hawaiian shirt typically has a brightly colored polynesian print and whenever we see these Hawaiian shirts, I think one of the big clues is Elvis, the king of you know music, Elvis. But also the Polynesian print and the mean of Polynesian is multiple islands, like what we're seeing here. And now I kind of embellished the colors a little bit, but to me the shapes were kind of pretty clearly on the bottom some sort of a straw hat that was cut up and on the top part before we get to the Vegapunk snow globe on top, that that connection was also kind of a mushed up straw hat. And I believe that the straw hat kind of being a barrier between the underworld and the heavens, so to speak, might be a very real thing. Of course, it's important to note that one of the main definitions of hat is to seem or appear, which I think kind of ties into the whole illusion of the red line, but also to affect or have influence on or to act. So to kind of make someone do something is figuratively putting a hat on them. And I think in a very real way, the putting the hat on Luffy has kind of dictated the direction that he's gone the entire story in in some aspect. And not to get on too much of a crazy tangent, but I do believe that the straw hat in some way has kind of worked as an invisibility cloak to maybe Emu's vision over the whole world and one of the means of hat is to enter or penetrate and to get arrive at pass or progress towards a certain location so i think that the idea that maybe the hat has been used by shanks to kind of choose a, a monster to infiltrate you know enemy lines in some way is very real but i made this top part here red and blue kind of signify that the marines and the 
world government kind of working hand in hand to keep this facade of the Emerald City, the Holy Land of Mary Joa, the Holy Land of Mary Jane, the Green City, up above everybody else. And it's all kind of connected to this star at the top, kind of like a Christmas tree. And that Christmas tree thing, I think, kind of works twofold. One, it is what I was talking about earlier with the whole photosynthesis thing and utilizing star power through some sort of a energy vessel, like a tree or a black hole. But I think another version of that could simply be the moon and how the moon reflects sunlight and how that can be used in some form by many things like mushrooms and onions and cactuses to be you know, utilized as energy and fuel to grow. And I said that I colored in the candy stripe barbershop pole thing, the colors of the Sabote Archipelago, but I colored in this top part red and blue. And I said it was to represent kind of the Marines and the Celestial Dragons working together in some way. And I think that's because ultimately they're trying to keep the big red dragon asleep inside the Grand Line. Because this whole separation here with the colors and the lines, I think is to represent something that was hinted at all the way back in chapter one that I think the whole world has missed, which is something called a party wall. And I think that the same thing is being referenced in the Game of Thrones with the ice wall in the north. But a party wall, like Party's Bar in Chapter 1, is actually a boundary point or barrier that's agreed upon by both sides. And both parties, both sides of the wall, own half of it. And I think in a very real way, that's because the Marines and the Celestial Dragons are working together to make sure that something doesn't erupt from inside of the red line maybe or awaken from underneath the you know red line inside the earth's core and this vega punk over this you know mary joa snow globe in the middle is the only time in this whole pretty much chapter that we see the word vega punk whole and i think that's because in some way up there there is some truth because all of the parties that are involved believe that they're trying to save the world so everything that they're doing in their eyes is righteous because every act that they undertake and every criminal they prosecute and everything like that, they believe it's ultimately an act to keep the world safe and, you know, save it from being eaten or melted or flooded. And like how Sun Wukong was sent away from heaven by Buddha to stop causing trouble so that he wouldn't kind of destroy heaven and he was sent on a meaningless quest, I think in a very real way, the party walls of the One Piece world, starting from Party's Bar, going all the way to both sides of the red line, are, you know, kind of the very same boundaries and edges of a board game for Luffy. And maybe kind of the playpen and the perfectly built distraction area for the Ragnarok starting Luffy. And speaking of parties and distractions, on a meta level is this right side of the panel where we see this obvious fidget spinner and it looks like the Vega punk writing part. The Vega is written kind of in like tube, like neon lights like a bar would have. I think all kind of referencing the distraction of that idea of a party. And the key idea that many, many, many rampaging destruction gods are oftentimes appeased and put to sleep in some way by alcohol and being tricked into drinking copious amounts of alcohol to be forced to kind of fall asleep and then, you know, everyone's saved from them and, and the rampage ends. And we even have the headphone looking thing on the top that seems to be, I think, a clue to that. And I do actually think, you have to check out my Bink Saki video, but I do think that the recording and stealing of Luffy's voice of all creation and something like that is what one, you know, Brook part of the, you know, One Piece story is doing. And we even see the uh, Brook or Rook chess piece in the corner. Now, I think what's very interesting about that is I believe that chess piece most likely could be a bishop on top. And I believe that Brook and his scars on his head and the way they are is all a reference to the bishop chess piece. And that this whole right side here might just be a huge clue into the entire idea of using music to influence and control every aspect of the One Piece world. And, and when I say music, what I mainly mean is the frequencies produced by those, which we've seen control humans and animals alike, and especially in the newest One Piece movie, Film Red. And so since we kind of talked about this right side of the chessboard maybe being the bishop part, the left side, I think, might be kind of a rook part and, and, and the castle, so to speak. And what I mean by that is we have these kind of weird looking fake palm tree things with this tubular structure kind of traveling from it into two other kind of star orb structures. And I believe that that's all actually kind of a reference to Shanks having stolen the elixir of youth or the contents of the Holy Grail and has been distributing that throughout the One Piece world as kind of a trade and bargaining system to remain in power. But this whole thing here kind of being a symbolic representation of kind of 
taking that tree like a straw, you know, stopping and, and going with the light here, with the traffic light uh, there, and deciding, you know, which aspects of the tower it goes to. This one that's here to the space monster, or this one that's here to the earth dragon. And I understand that one's very hard to, to follow, and I will have future videos just about that aspect of Shanks and the Holy Grail, and, and what exactly is that special wine and sake from his hometown that he keeps bringing around everywhere. And so let's cut to one that's going to blow your mind with visual proof. And it's this weird-looking Riddler Poneglyph one. And I know that that sounds very, very crazy. So just please bear with me for a moment because this is going to really blow your mind. This stack of weird-looking bricks attached to the video game controller and then this one-eyed-looking thing at the bottom, which we'll just call Usopp, and you'll understand why in a second. But we follow it up and it leads directly into the mouth of that banana gator space monster thing. I do believe that is all a reference to the Poneglyphs ultimately being a you know walkway or pathway, a, a, a yellow brick road, so to speak, into the mouth of, you know, I, I call it the big bad wolf, but here it is obviously a, a alligator creature. But I talk in my Poneglyphs are a trap video that the last road Poneglyph has kind of been hijacked by Whitebeard and taken to Sphinx Island. And one of the main reasons I think that is because of all the myths and legends around Sphinxes, especially the riddle of the Sphinx. And I believe that Oda's, you know, obviously is influenced by millions of things, but superhero comics and Batman in particularly, I think are huge ones. And this question mark thing is a very obvious sign to me of the Riddler from Batman. And I don't think coincidentally, the Riddler was played by Jim Carrey in the ill-fated Batman and Robin movie. Well, I think all that, we, we, we know how much Frankie's related to Ace Ventura and Jim Carrey and, and all that stuff. I think that's all kind of a reference here to just, just the, the various crazy things. But just the Riddler here being the main thing with that and the Poneglyphs being a kind of road to this sleeping creature maybe underneath Sphinx Island. You'll have to watch my Poneglyphs are trapped, like I said, for more on that stuff. But what I don't talk about in that video is what the Poneglyphs are trying to do, which this panel actually explains verbatim. You see this video game controller here in the middle with this directional pad, and I believe that that's all a reference to some sort of underground force using the Poneglyphs to move individuals, like you would, you know, pressing buttons on, on, a, on you know, a game boy controller. Well, what's most interesting about that is this bottom creature here. Now you see how it has like the goggle looking things in the top and one of the eyes is cut off, there's the teeth in the middle, and then there's a very suspicious looking purse type hexagon thing in the corner here. Well, all of that is a reference to Usopp and especially Usopp in this cover here. The chapter covered at chapter 221 has Usopp here kind of planning things and he's making a power alarm clock. Now the power alarm clock looks suspiciously the same has all of these weird rocket things. And you'll also notice that with the angle used by Oda, the Usopp's head only shows one eye, almost like that goggle thing is kind of covering it like an eye patch, just like this base cylinder thing here of the building. Well, but the most prominent thing always shown on Usopp, it, Usopp is his frog bag. And that's what this hexagon thing is. It's the fucking frog bag thing. We've all heard the expression, clothes make the man. But is it really true? Now, all of this, what does this whole crazy C page mean thing? Because why on earth would making this this power alarm clock thing matter? Well, I forgot to mention earlier, too, that Usopp actually has a peg leg here, too. But when we use a little bit of light magic, we see that there's Luffy, Zoro, and Sanji sleeping here on the bench. When we use some light magic, they all kind of line up to this chapter where it was when the Straw Hat crew, right before Jaya, they went underwater and found that shipwreck thing and then they were eaten by a huge turtle well they're all kind of trapped in there and i and well you you see that on the bowie system thing the, the the pulley system that uh gorilla guy uses as a salvager it actually has that banana thing on the very tip of it too ah here we are oh, don't be a darn fool walker that's the way we came in it is are you sure and I believe that whatever is using the Poneglyphs to kind of awaken something is actually trying to get this creature to open its mouth so that maybe someone like a Geppetto type figure that's trapped inside of it can escape. And that in many ways there may be a figurative or literal god or father or creature trapped inside the belly of a whale, so to speak. And they've been kind of trying to manipulate the story to escape from that 
prison. The suspense is terrible. He, he's gonna go this time. I hope it'll last. And now, of course, we all have heard ideas about the One Piece being trapped inside of a giant whale, and the entire top of this panel has the laugh tail whale and the, uh, the Zoe whale tree thing. Well, in the One Piece story, symbolically, that kind of round shape of Laboon's head with a highlighted white spot, I do believe is always a reference to kind of a star or a sun being trapped in a tower of some sort. The idea being that stars are always surrounded by darkness, and then to see them at all, you kind of need that darkness to surround them. Okay, I'm going to put a little mustard on this one, all right? Give me a hot dog, baby! All right. But I think it's kind of all a reference to kind of a veil being pulled over the stars themselves and, and hidden from the One Piece world so you can't use them for navigation or anything like that. Well, I know that sounds really crazy, but we all, if, if there's anything to the idea that there's a star or a fireman trapped inside of a whale, well... If their name happens to be Davy Jones, that is, of course, the name of the original Starman himself, David fucking Bowie. And I am pretty sure we are going to see David Bowie, the Starman, come out of a fucking whale at some point soon in the story. Excuse me, question time will come at the end of the session. We must press on. Come along. And now I know that that Usopp Geppetto one sounds like it would probably be the craziest one, but I don't actually think that it's the craziest building formation being hinted at here. I think that this one is as connected to Luffy here. And I say connected to Luffy, but as I was kind of alluding to earlier, I think that this whole entire place is, and everywhere in these tubes and in the background, we see a very distinct looking eye, 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 eye. And I think all of that is kind of to show the flow and movement of imagination and the power of imagination flowing throughout this entire world. Now, that can sound really, really crazy. And it, it all relates to the idea of evil video I've been promising. It's actually going to be my next video. As soon as I'm done with this one, I'm finishing the editing on that one so it's out next week for Halloween. This idea of evil and a horror tree connections video coming out next. But as crazy as all that sounds, I think that this structure thing here actually kind of proves part of it. If you'll give me a moment to explain. I was talking about David Bowie before and David Bowie's original name being Davy Jones. David Jones. Well, he was actually an actor in a movie of a television show of Twin Peaks called Fire Walk With Me. And in Twin Peaks, he played a detective that literally disappears in time. Ah! For God's sakes, Jeffries, where the hell have you been? You've been gone down here two years. It was a dream. We live inside a dream. You'll have to check out uh, this video, if you like Twin Peaks and you and you want to know about that series and the return and all that stuff, this guy, Twin Perfect, has a great video where he really does explain the entire story. Now, sadly, I actually think that I've discovered a second half to all the symbolism that I've kind of created this channel around. And I am not saying that he has gotten anything wrong in his video. I think everything in that is right. I just think it's only half of it. Well... As crazy as it sounds, I believe that the way the Twin Peaks works is all about diverting the audience's attention and whatever has attention gains life and, and all sorts of crazy things. Well, I believe that Berserk and One Piece actually function in a very similar way. And in a very real way, whatever Luffy kind of gives his attention and gives his light to, kind of shines his attention light to, gets life and, and, and lives in the manga pages from that. Well, going back to the Twin Peaks movie, David Bowie plays a detective who literally is cut out of the film after his purpose is served, okay? Well, in the newest series, The Return, he actually comes back and he's like a tea kettle and they kind of are brewing evil and doing all sorts of weird things with, with that. So that's just too hard to explain here. But I believe kind of in a very literal way, it's kind of the spirit of the entirety of the red shirts in all of media kind of banging together and, and being resentful of their deaths and that kind of brewing in some sense and like the idea evil and berserk how everything kind of brews from the abyss to the surface all as part of kind of humanity's attempt to make sense of the evil and terrors of the world and their suffering i believe that this tkl thing is taking power and and belief and hope and whatever energies from chopper and luffy and essentially the entirety of the underground of the one piece world and i think that's what this un thing here is for is for like the underground the underneath source of energy trans transporting them into a dream world that maybe is not a part of our world anymore. And I say that because 
there's this crazy cover here that is shaped the same way as this where we have this like wooden house built in the background robin in the front and she's given a hyena a second leg and a, a third leg and all these weird things but i believe that all of this is a representation of a future eclipse type situation yes like the one from berserk where a portal is opened in the moon and i'm thinking it's going to be some sort of frost giants if that's not what's going to come out of the red line itself but it might also be just something that makes luffy kind of go mad and turn him into a crazy ores frost giant because it's important to note that a mirror a mirror is a window into the soul but it's also a mirror like from attack on titan and i believe that that kind of wordplay and what a moon and the energies and how it interacts with the earth and us humans is a thing that the Beast of Ymir and the Well of Ymir have always kind of been referencing. And Luffy, very, very the same as Goku's Saiyan Beast transformation thing, I believe might be on the horizon when this eclipse door is opened. It might turn Luffy into a crew-eating beast. Now, of course, just like this cover shows that it's happened in the past multiple times, and I think that that has successfully happened to the Luffy character, at least in two or three iterations before now, I think obviously we're seeing this version of the story because we're going to get a different ending where that Ymir door may be used for good instead of evil or at least to change the powers of the One Piece world and get them to wake up. But as usual, I'm sure that sounds super, super crazy. So I'll have to touch on it in future videos. If you watched this long, thank you so, so much for watching the video. Please like and share and subscribe and think about you know commenting and all that stuff. Uh, I can't you know do this without all of you. Thank you so, so much. My name is Amjin Rakai. I will talk to you all later. Bye-bye.